All right, good morning, everyone. It's still relatively the new year. In some faces we haven't seen since last year. Thank you for that. Ooh, loud. And uh, I'm excited. I'm sure you guys are excited to be here. You know, you're not here for the food or Victor or me, but you're here to hear and meet with the Lord. Uh, maybe the food, but with the Lord. Mainly, so I'm sure you guys are excited to hear the word. Uh, John ch ch chapter 14. Uh, was, obviously, we, we think of the, what, the hot topic recently of the Trinity, and maybe you thought I was speaking on that, but uh, I don't want to touch that this morning. I just want to speak on greater works, greater works, as we read there earlier. And uh, so I'm just thinking, um, still earlier in the year, and I just wanted to get a focus on, at least in my mind, my passion uh, for me as of recent, and even what I think of for this year, what I want uh, in, in terms of the greater works, which I'll explain to you. So, uh, actually, before we, we continue on, I'm just going to quickly pray just, uh, just to, for God to settle my mind. So, dear God, I just thank you, Lord, for this morning, and I just pray that I'll be able to share your word with uh, your dear people here, and I know they're eager, uh, and that's why they're here. And thanks be to you, God, for saving us. That through your death, burial, and resurrection, we are saved. Pray uh, you help me put the words in my mouth, and give me a calm mind and a calm spirit, help me to speak uh, boldly as well and peaceably. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Pray your spirit guide us and move us this morning and help us to go on and do greater works for you this week and for the year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so John chapter 14, I wanted to uh, just give you the backdrop in chapter 13. Uh, this, just before we get up to this. So Jesus, in chapter 13, he was washing his disciples' feet just by way of a quick uh, uh, recap of what, coming up to this point. Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and Peter obviously is like, no, not, not my, uh, he didn't want to say, Lord, Lord, you shouldn't wash my feet. And then Jesus rebukes him. And then, and then he's like, all right, wash my whole body, right? And then next thing he's, he says to the disciples that uh, someone's going to betray him. And shortly after that, he says, where he goes, he'll go away, that they cannot go. And so Peter then once again says, you know, wherever you're going, you know, I'm going to go with you. And, he's, and, and, and Jesus makes a prophecy of that. If you'll deny me three times when the cock crows. So chapter 14 begins, he continues to say again, the, as we read earlier, uh, that he's going to go away, and that, uh, that Thomas then says, you know, how can we know the way if we don't even know where you're going? So that's where we see the famous John 14, 6, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then Philip says, um, you know, the popular part where, show us the Father. And then Jesus says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? So now we come back to this point, and uh, this is what I want to pick up on in John 14. Um, I'll read from verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, How have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Ooh, sorry. Press the wrong button there. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And this is the main point I wanted to get to, or the main verse, uh, to focus on this, this morning. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So I wanted to quickly address a few things on uh, this passage and uh, the greater works. So firstly and foremost, who can do the greater works? Who can do the greater works? All right, so we see in John 14, uh, 12, the very part, the, ver the beginning, very, very simply, he that believeth in me. We see that phrase, he that believeth in me. And throughout John, you see that phrase, uh, he that believeth in me, or he that believeth on me, or believeth in me, in my name, on my name. Uh, it's very common in the New Testament. And it's always mostly referred to the same thing. And we'll get to a few verses here. But I like how in, uh, in the Gospels you hear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see verily used a lot. And then John, the book of John, he's like, verily, verily. You know, it's like truly, truly. Like, absolutely. Verily, verily. So what does this mean? What does this phrase mean? Who can do the greater works? It says, he that believeth on me. So that phrase uh, always almost always references or refers to someone at the point of salvation. Someone getting saved. The point where they get saved. Uh, they're coming to salvation. So let's see a few verses, in, particularly in John, as we stay here, mostly. John 1.12, very popular verse and very elementary to, to most of us. But just way of, uh, it's good to rehearse and, 
and to uh, keep this in repetition so it's come solid, uh, solidified in our minds, right? So John 1, 12. Uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So that same phraseology, he that believeth on me, or believe on his name, about Jesus. John 5, 24. Another popular one. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So once again, believeth on him. All right, so I like this verse because uh, this sort of uh, has that, um, in gives inspiration to that uh, a song, a song I really like. You know, verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. So I like that song. It's very, uh, very biblical. And um, yeah, you see that throughout, you know, when you read it, him, uh, I know I'm like, sort of like being the song leader these days, I get to see this. And so I'm going to try and implement songs in the sermons, right? So John 5, 24, I like that. And that song. Uh, another, another similar passage, John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I send to you, he that uh, believeth on me hath everlasting life. Very, very basic, very simple uh, to follow that one. Uh, John 11, this is one of the memory verses we have for the kids and even for the adults that are doing it. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And believest thou this? So in this part, it's the same phraseology, he that believeth in me. So once again, it's either talking about someone getting saved or at the point of salvation, or eternal life, which is, you've got to have them one and the same. But if you have salvation, you have eternal life. Uh, John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So a reference to eternal security in that sense, or even uh, for salvation. And this is a similar passage. Uh, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow ri rivers of living water. So once again, uh, in, if you combine these two verses together, shall never thirst, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So referencing, you know, eternal security. And another song that sort of uh, comes to mind is, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever heard this, because in, in, in Sunday school when I was a bit younger, they had that song like, um, the, I have a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see, opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I have a river of life flowing out of me. So that song, it's uh, another, good, another good thing. So yeah, I love these songs. Uh, sorry to get a bit of a tangent, but you know, sometimes it just gets you thinking about the Bible and just uh, changes your spirit and attitude. But who can do the works as we uh, quickly recap? It's people that are saved. You know, he that believeth on him, Jesus Christ, or he that believeth in him, uh, believeth on his name, believeth in his name. So Jesus is referencing believers, saved believers, but who can do the works? And uh, some people, they try to use this passage to talk about, um, oh, sorry, as we're going to the point, what is the work? Some people try to say, you know, is it, is it the gifts that we see in Corinthians? You know, the, the speaking of tongues and the healings and, and all that? Or, or is it the, the miracles that Jesus did? And, um, you know, when I was a bit younger, uh, obviously through Sunday school, you learn all the Bible stories and you hear it. And the first time I heard about Jesus walking, I remember that night where I was in the bathtub and I, I just made like a little shallow water and I was just trying to like my best to like quickly run in it. And then um, obviously I can't because I'm just a man, but um, you, you have that mindset, like what is the works Jesus is referencing to? You know, what is the, the that works that believers can do? Um, you know, is it, is it the, all the miracles that he did, you know, turning the, the water into wine or feeding the multitudes, the 4,000 and the 5,000? Is it some, something like that? Can we do that as believers? Is it the casting out of devils? Is it... Um, you know, healing the sick, making the lame to, uh, to walk and the blind to see, you know? Is it healing the leprous people? What is the works? Uh, what is the works? Well, let's read once again, John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So I think if you read further along, you'd sort of know it's got to do with time, but we'll get to that bit later. The, the works that I do shall he do also, the believer. All right, so what is the work? John, uh, as we're staying in John, it sort of uh, defines that for us, what the work is. In John chapter 6, we read here a bit of a lengthy passage. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was 
none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which dureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto him, them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So, Jesus is referencing this. It's, it's got to do with the gospel. Whether telling people to believe, or you yourself believe, believe on him whom he hath sent. So, the work is... What I see in the scripture in referencing it to is that of, of the gospel, the work of the gospel, it's whether to you yourself need to be saved or to believe on him and, or tell other people also if you are uh, to believe on him. To the work is the gospel. John chapter 9, uh, I did chuck out a big, big chunk of this chapter. I don't want to read the whole thing, but we can, we'll read this part and get to the end of it. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So we see this blind man. He's, the people were asking him, like, why is he blind? So God, Jesus makes the, the point and defines it for them that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And if you read the chapter, which I've taken out just for time's sake, but just for a re uh, refresher, uh, people were starting to question, like, this guy now sees. He was, this is the guy we knew he was blind. But now he sees, and then they were disputing, like, is this the guy? Uh, or is it someone that looks like him? And then some people were saying, no, it's him. It's, he says that he hears himself. And then the Pharisees, since this was actually on a Sabbath day, said, you know, this guy is clearly not of God. He's doing it on the Sabbath. And then they're trying to ask this man, like, you know, who made you to see again? Who made you to see, sorry? Who healed your blindness? And then, he, uh, sorry, they, they first asked his parents, and, he's, and their parents were a bit scared because the Pharisees uh, would, you know, persecute them. So they said, you know, he's, he's old. Uh, my son is of old age. You can ask him. So they went to the guy and says, you know, who healed, who healed you? And so he's saying, like, hey, you know, you can speak to the man who healed me. I've already told you. You already know uh, who I'm, I've, I've referenced to. Why don't you go ask him? And so they're disputing with him. And, and all he says is, you know, all I know was that I couldn't see, and now I see. And so now here, um, and then the Pharisees then cast him out. And this is where we pick up in John 9, 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believed. And he worshipped him. So, once again, we see Jesus being God because he's been worshipped here. But John 9, as we remember, we, we saw earlier that uh, Jesus was saying, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So some people thought that the works was, in this sense, uh, you know, healing the, the, the eyes. But then we see, if we reference this to John, make a, a reference to John 6, that we see what, what the work was, that it was to believe on Jesus Christ, as we see here at the end. So that is the work of God that we see in uh, John chapter 9, not, not, the, the, not primarily that his eyes were healed, but that he received his sight, but that he believed on the Son of God. Dost thou believe? This is the same man. Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he? that I might believe on him. So this is a work of God, as we see. And so that is, uh, answers that, in, even in John, as we see the context of, of what is, who's the, who, who can do the greater works, or who can do the works, and uh, what is the works, which is the gospel, the work of the gospel, that Jesus died, he was buried and rose again, and to believe on him. All right, so how do we then have uh, greater works? How do we see greater works then? Because it says in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he do, 
and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So I think the key part of this obviously is the end there, because I go unto my Father. All right, so, um, and I'm just going to take a bit of a sidetrack here, uh, just to, when Jesus basically goes, what I'm going to say is, uh, when Jesus goes, obviously the, the Holy Ghost comes, and the Holy Spirit, so that's the, at the part there, because I go unto my Father. And we see, I guess, in Acts, uh, the, which we'll get to in ch chapter 1, um, that Jesus leaves him, and then the, very shortly after that, that we see many people getting saved, right? But just a bit of a detour here. Uh, when Jesus goes, we have the Holy Spirit uh, coming in John 16, 7. We'll just have a few verses to show you. Now, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, which will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So Jesus will go, and then the, he will send the Comforter, uh, which is his spirit, really, uh, if you read the other passages. And uh, there's this, I guess I'd say my favorite, uh, not my favorite, but like, you know, there's a very common, I'm um, oh, sorry, a very popular Muslim apologist, and you'd probably know him, like, you know, Zakar Naik. And he'll try to tell you that Muhammad is uh, the comforter. You know, that, that Muhammad's shown in the Bible in, in, in Son of Solomon, Muhammad. And, or if you go to John, it talks about the comforter will come. Now, Jesus will send the comforter. And, you know, he'll quote so much verses. And, and it's probably a bit of a shame that, you know, he'll quote more verses than some of the people like, that are Christians, you know. So he'll quote so much uh, scripture and... Um, and I'll tell you, you know, that, that Jesus will send the comforter. But the one thing he won't quote is obviously John 14, uh, where it talks about uh, the, Holy, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which we'll see. So, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it, it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So in this passage... I've, ever, I've even heard him quote this, that in verse 16 it says, He may abide with you forever. So obviously Muhammad didn't live forever on earth. So obviously that's not, he's not the comforter in this passage. But in this one, John 14, 26, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, this, so there's a bit of a reason why I bring up the comforter and the Holy Ghost here. Because uh, in Acts, we'll see shortly what happens. Um, but another verse, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So once again, sorry, I double um, uh, copy this one. But similar message that when Jesus goes, the Comforter will come. All right, so, and that is, without a doubt, the Holy Ghost, not Muhammad. So jumping to Acts 1 now. Remember the greater works or... How it is it greater works? Because we know the works is, uh, of uh, the gospel, but, and it's of what believers do. So how is in greater works? Is it greater in, in what way? So that's, uh, we'll see that in Acts chapter 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, I like that, infallible proofs. is like, is without, without doubt, you know, he proved that, that he rose again, that he himself showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So there's no mistaking that he rose again, that he did die and that he rose again. Um, continuing, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together, them which, uh, that with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of, to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put on his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So now we see Jesus uh, being ascended after he talks to the disciples. So if you remember what happens, when, what Jesus was saying in, 
uh, in John about the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit coming. Jesus goes, the Holy Spirit comes. Shortly, what happens? Um, shortly after. Now we see what happens. Then said Peter, after, Pe- sorry, after Pe- Peter preaches to the multi- people there, uh, we come up to Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Even, oh, sorry. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were, uh, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 souls uh, was added to this, them this day. So remember, greater works, greater how. If we collect all the believers and we were doing uh, soul winning, we are preaching the gospel, which is what the work is, you know, we see many more people saved. Obviously, if Jesus Christ stayed on earth till now, he would have won more people to, uh, won, got more people saved. But he left. Remember when we saw read earlier that he was going to depart because he goes to his father? So it's greater, how is it greater? It's, it's more time that he uh, stayed short time on earth to share, to share the gospel. But for us believers, the people that believe, that believed on his name, doing the works, obviously we can continue that work. And that's what the greater works is, that we can continue uh, doing... Uh, the, the gospel and sharing the gospel and that's how it's greater that we, we get to have the opportunity to share the gospel more but uh, I just want to quickly touch on this in Acts 2.38 because uh, a lot of people try to use this to say you know repent of your sins and you have to be baptized to be saved but it doesn't say repent of your sins here it just says to repent so it's repent of unbelief repent from dead works and trust in the work of Christ and it says to be baptized right so it doesn't say repent of sins but it says and be baptized so remember, uh, one of our memory verses in Acts 19.4 says, Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism, baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So it's not a water baptism, it would be the baptism of the Holy Ghost, right? So being saved. Uh, so it's not that uh, people were baptized and that's what, we, that's what got them to the church, or that's how the, the 3,000 souls were added. That's not the case. It was people believed in that's how they got, they were added, the 3,000 souls. And so that's the greater works that we see, that um, not just here, but continuing on, you see that the apostles, they can see, uh, they're continuing in the ministry, that they're preaching um, and spreading out from Jerusalem all the way, P- particularly Paul, you know, he's going out and doing his missionary journeys, preaching the gospel. So that's how it's greater, greater works, the work which is, you know, the gospel, greater how, uh, that we have the opportunity as God is not um, obviously on earth right now physically um, but we as believers have this opportunity to share the gospel and that is how it is greater works uh, I have this other verse that shows that um, baptism is not part of the gospel and I think it's a pretty clear one 1 Corinthians 1 17 for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect so Paul is saying that uh, basically, he separates the gospel and baptism, and we know the gospel in Matthew. Uh, sorry, First Corinthians 15. It talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So baptism has nothing to do uh, in terms of getting saved. Uh, when you preach the gospel, you don't have to be baptized. You just have to believe in Christ. All right, so that is how that is the work, and that is how it is greater works. Right? We can have we have the opportunity uh, to share the gospel and do greater works. You know, and um, the first, sometimes when, as a young person, when you read John 14, you think, wow, I can do greater works than God. I can do, I can do all the, the miracles that he did. I can, uh, but no, that's not the case. You know, it's, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. And if you really think about it, you know, if you heal someone, it's probably temporary. They're going to die anyway. If you go to the hospitals, let's say, for instance, you know, we go to the hospital, we, can, we have that gift or miracle, miracles of healing. You know, that's only temporary. That person's still going to die eventually. But if you can share the gospel, that's forever. That's eternal. And that's what I'd rather have, you know? Rather than trying to show myself as someone that shows miracles and does all the great things that, hey, look, I made this lame to walk. I made this guy to see again. I'd, isn't it more powerful to share and change someone's eternal life? You know, that's more greater than, than showing, you know, as for show, the, the health things or even just trying to pretend to speak in tongues that we speak, I'm speaking another language that I never knew. 
Now, those are all really just uh, a sign and a show for things that are physical rather than spiritual. All right, so what does that lead to? You know, we see who can do the works, which is believers. We can see what the work is, and we can see how it's greater because Jesus goes to the Father. And we have now the time that we can share the gospel. So it leads us now to us. Uh, as believers, we have the ministry of reconciliation. All right, so we read this in 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, you know, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto, their, unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet, no, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconcilia re reconciliation. So Paul here is showing us that, you know, Christ, as he's gone, he's given to us, and as he or calls people to help, basically, he's given to us a ministry of reconciliation. And so reconciling, obviously, is to make even or to make uh, odd things meet together, to uh, balance, you know, two odd opposing things, to bring together uh, two things. How do you reconcile you know, two things that are odd. That's basically the idea we have. Re reconciliation. We're trying to win the lost to Christ. Get people that are unsaved to saved. Right? So that's what God does. Obviously, that's what He wants. And um, we see this in First Timothy 2. You know, this is the will of God, basically. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So that reconciling that we have to do, we have to share the gospel to people, that is a ministry that we should be all, all involved in. You know, a lot of uh, time in, when I was younger in, in the Baptist church, you know, everyone, everyone has that idea like, you know, I want to know the will of God in me. What's God going to do for me? I want to get involved in ministry. Should I be a missionary or, or a pastor or a song leader? Or should I, you know, be the pianist or whatever the ministry may be, you know? This is a ministry that everyone should be involved in, the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what everyone can be involved in. Uh, and that's really what God wants every believer to do, to be part of. Winning the lost, whether, whatever it may be. Being, uh, helping people to know the gospel. Helping people to know Jesus, to be saved. And um, this is what God does for us. For He's the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And that's what um, Jesus reconciles ultimately. But this is the will of God, and we have to, as Christians, you know, when we question what the will of God is in our lives, this is one of them. You know, we, we have to share the gospel. He wants all people to be saved. And so this also sort of, I'd say, goes against what Calvinists teach, that God uh, picks and chooses who gets saved. You know, this is clear. Who will have all men to be saved? You know, if, if, if God really did pick and choose who got saved, this, he's not picking according to his will. In uh, First Timothy two four, but for us, you know, we have the ministry of reconciliation. We all have that part where we can share the gospel. We have an, a part where we tell people, you know, you can be saved today, and it's not because of your works, but because of Jesus Christ through His death, burial, and resurrection, and to believe on Him. And that is the ministry we have. All right. So, continuing on with as, uh, another reference to what um, the will of God. Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Promise, but as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us with, not willing that, sh that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God doesn't want anyone to go to hell, but that's their choice, right? And uh, they're worthy of deserving of hell. So we all should have that, um, have a part in this ministry. We should all try to strive to be part of the ministry of reconciliation. You know, maybe you don't, you don't think like you should be called to preach here or to lead or do song leading, but you should be part of the ministry of reconciliation. You should be going out. Every believer, every one of us in here has that part, and we have to go out and preach the gospel. As the Bible says, you know, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, that's not just for the apostles, that's for every believer. Be part of the greater work. Be part of the work that we can do for God, the work of God. I want to share with you this uh, story in Numbers 11. 
Uh, and Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the table, the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two, two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And there were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So these two, Eldad and there was basically 70 men. They were supposed to meet at the tabernacle, and uh, God the, put the spirit on them, and then they started prophesying. But these two men that were supposed to go, they went there. They were part of, they stayed in the, the camp, which is basically where the people were sleeping, you know, uh, where the tribes were sleeping, because the tabernacle was a bit of a way. Uh, so let's continue. But they went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. Verse 27, And there ran a young man, and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad, do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto them, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord will put his spirit upon them. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And so this is what, the spirit, this is what I want to share, you know, that, this story that as Moses is saying, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord will put his spirit upon them. You know, that we have an opportunity, not only, you know, day-to-day -day life, but we have a time where we can meet Sunday afternoon, Thursday evening. We can share the gospel, we can preach the gospel and do the work of God. Share that gospel. You know, that's really what changes people's lives eternally. You know, would God that all the Lord's people, you know, all of us here, we're prophets, that we can preach the gospel and that the Lord will put His Spirit upon you guys, that we would preach, you know, not just in here in church, but in the camp, where we go out into the hedges and highways and we preach the gospel. Would God that would be the case? You know, so for 2024, this year, you know, as you do the work, or as we see the greater works or the work of God, of the gospel, would God that we would share that this year, we'll be more stronger in that, you know? Uh, and this is sort of the proof of what I was saying about the tabernacle and the, and the camp. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. So the tabernacle was separate from where they were staying. All right, so Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 9.16, a very strong, strong message here. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for a necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And that is what should be for us today. You know, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me. And this is really the, the big thing that we should share, strive for. If hell was real, you know, if hell really was true and you really understood what hell was, wouldn't preaching the gospel be the biggest thing for you? You know, if hell is eternity, hell is for eternal, is an eternal punishment. You know, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Don't you have that mindset? Is, is hell real today? It's, it's real, my friends. So let's, not, let's, not, let's take 2024, uh, taking the work of God and doing it greater. All right, so what are some things that hinder the ministry of reconciliation? Things that hinder that ministry? Or, you know, all of us that we have a part to share the gospel. One thing is fear, you know. Uh, and there's a few things we can be fear, fearful of, but I'll just touch on two for this one. Um, you know, some people probably are fearful of rejection. Uh, sometimes you're probably fearful of getting into an argument that you're not, uh, you're not you know, wanting to have, right? You, but that's not really the case. If anyone that's ever been to soul winning with us, or if you, even if you try to share with a friend, you know, most times you can, um, it's, it's usually friendly. You know, 99% of the times it's, it's never a fight. It's never really an argument where you're screaming over each other. Or you see in YouTube, you know, the speaker's corner, if you ever see that, you know, they're all screaming over no, mom is this, or Jesus is that, or the Bible says this. It's, it's never that. It's maybe in that specific section, but when you go soul winning, you know, as, with, a, with the right mind and the right attitude, that's almost never the case. So fear, it's like, I guess, you know, would you let your children play in the playground, and you, or would you decide, would you not allow them because, oh, they might get into a fight. You know, that's not the case, right? We would still let the child play because that's, getting into a fight is really rarely the case, at least in our areas. Right? And even in the, if that was the case, you know, it's basically how you speak or how you speak to other people um, that can diffuse the situation. You know, you're never going to go to someone like, hey, believe Jesus, you're a sinner. You, know, you always try to share, the, hey, you know, can I share the gospel to you? 
You know, it's, it, you're not going to get, it's really, really get into a fight. Unless you, you yourself are very arrogant and loud spoken, it's going to be never the case. So there's nothing really to be afraid of. And uh, even when you're, uh, even in your speaking, you know, you have the, the, the Bible verses that talk about speech. Like, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So grace, you know, you see it's seasoned with salt. It's like that, uh, what's that guy that does the meat and puts the salt on? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the salt bay, that's right. You know, let your speech be always with grace, you know, seasoned with salt. So, but, um, you know, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So if we go to preach the gospel with, you know, being calm, collected, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. And maybe if you've never been, you don't know what to do, just come anyway, but I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later. But just know this, um, that even if they reject you and say, no, that's, that's it, it's not really you, it's Jesus. You know, he that heareth you and he heareth me, he that despises you despises me, and he that despises me despises him that sent me. John 15, 18, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So we go out to the message to share, because we love the people, right? We want them to get saved. We don't want anyone to go to hell. You know, but they, if they hate Jesus, it's, it's not you that they're rejecting. It's not you that they hate. It's really Jesus Christ. Right? And we've got nothing to worry about there. All right, in 2 Kings 7, um, I want to share this story. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then the Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine in the, is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit there, here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall unto the hosts of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go in, unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come, into the, come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made a host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and of great, uh, a noise of horses, even the noise of, the, of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired us against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Uh, so just going to skip for a second time. So these, um, these four leprous people, you know, they, they were obviously surrounded by this an army and they're like you know what let's just take the risk let's just go out there you know whether we're here you know it's not going to change much but if we go out you know at least we're taking the chance you know and so well, let's have that mindset you know even even if you don't know what you're, you're going to do what you say if you're fearful be like these leprous people you know there's all use that take that chance take that opportunity and uh we see that they found the, the, spo the spoils and the goods there and they're taking upon them themselves all right so just fast forwarding, 1 Corinthians 15. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So always... I like that end of the verse. That's a memory verse we have. Um, but we have that mindset that um, <clears throat> you know, to share the gospel. Because we think about, um, you know, if you're fearful of other people, there's nothing really to be afraid of. You know, death, where is thy sting? A grave, where is thy victory? I know this is a bit of an extreme example, but the sting of death is sin and the strength of the, of the law is sin. But thanks be to God, which give us, us, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible can defend itself if you, if you know, even if you speak to other people that sort of know what the Bible says or has a glimpse of what the Bible says. If you ever read a context of the passage uh, or in length, you know, they always try to pick, cherry pick one verse that will prove, you know, whether it works salvation or something of Islam or another religion. You know, you can always read the whole passage and God always makes it clear what he's speaking about. You know, so there's nothing to be worried about. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why... Uh, Paul continues on, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So what we do when we share the gospel, it's not in vain, you know, that his word will not return void. 
Um, so always share the gospel. Don't be fearful. Don't, there's nothing to be afraid of when you go out. It can be shared. Even if, you, even if you don't know what to say, as we get to here. It should be, in a sense, if you've, if you've come to church for a long time, if you've come to TCL for a couple of years and you don't know what to say, then it should be a shame. But if you're sort of new to soul winning and you don't know what to say, you know, still come, because I like this verse of 1 Samuel 30, for who will hearken unto you in this matter, but as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarried by the stuff, they shall part alike. So David's saying, you know, they, there were 600 people that he went to, went to battle, and 200, they went to a certain part, and only 200 stayed at that part because they were tired and weary. And then the rest came and, and they won the battle. And then they came back. And uh, David's basically saying, yeah, you know, these guys have stayed by the stuff. You know, they still went to, went to the battle, technically, in his eyes, that they will be paid the same. And so, you know, come as a silent partner. You know, if you, if you don't know what to say, just come as a silent partner on Thursdays and Sunday afternoons, you know, you're not sure. And you'll start to learn and start to hear, you know, how... Uh, how to share the gospel, how to uh, explain the gospel to people, but just by way of um, being there, just by hearing it by people, other people saying it. And you start to pick up on sharing the gospel, you know? Um, but if you, if you come here for a while and you don't know how to share the gospel, if you've never really done it, then it should be a shame. It says this in 2 Timothy 2.15, you know, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, are you, if you don't know what you're saying, if you don't, sorry, if you don't know what to say, are you studying? Are you studying the word to know what to say? You know, if you've been here for a while, you should know. You should know um, what to say, how to share the gospel. So it should be a shame if, if you don't know what to say. It says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You know, in the Bible, nakedness is often referenced as, uh, uh, as shame. You know, they, they try to make that, God tries to say, if, you've seen, if you have no clothes, if you're naked, then it's a shame, right? And we'll see some verses here, and we'll just jump through a few. Exodus 32, 25, and, Moses, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Uh, Isaiah 20, verse 4, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians, prisoners, and the, and the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. Um, Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I come as thee, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Um, so these are just very clear verses that show that if you're naked, it's showing your shame. I counsel thee to buy me of gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with ice lab, that thou mayest see. So the thing I wanted to say from this part is that, you know, when we get up for work, we try to change for workloads, right? But... If, if you're not studying the gospel, that's what it's like. You know, you're, not sh you're not putting on the clothes of the Bible. You're not putting on the whole armor of God. And it should be a shame. That you, even if you do go to work and you put on clothes, but if you're not studying the Bible, you know, you're in, God, in a sense, your spiritual sense, that you are naked. And that is a shame. That should be a shame for us. That we do not know the word of God. Especially if you've been here for a long time. And if you, have, if you don't know how to share the gospel, once again, start studying. Start coming. Start uh, going to the soul winning um, types that we meet. And it'll start to help you also on your personal life. Like you want to share the gospel to your work friend or your colleague. You don't know how. Um, these are ways you can grow. You know, you, you, you find people that um, are a bit more bold in sharing the gospel. And it sort of rubs off on you. And you know what to say. All right? So what hinders the, the ministry of the reconciliation? Fear was one. Shame is another that we don't know. Or we haven't studied. We're not ready. We're not prepared is another one. Another one is, it doesn't work attitude. It doesn't work. You know, the Bible says this in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed, you know, speaking of shame, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm here to tell you, my friends, this morning, our salvation, God's power to salvation, it still works today. You know, you might disagree with the message, method, but that's because you're not doing it. You know, most people that always try to disagree, like, oh, it doesn't work. It's usually the people that's never tried, they've never spent time in long time doing it. You know, whatever you think works, you know, they, we have this mindset that, you know, when I go out, I should be able to preach the gospel to everyone and everyone gets saved. That's not really the mindset, you know. We're not, we should know that we're not going to reach the majority of the people. You know, Christianity actually uh, only represents uh, 2.38 billion people in the world compared to the 8 billion 
we're already a minority. We're not, we're not a majority people. And of those 2.38, how many are really saved? We don't know. But it says this in Matthew 7, it's a very popular verse. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So we already know God is already, already knows and shown us to this that, you know, majority of the world is going on a path to hell basically. And only few really know the gospel. And if you, although all the world, as we see in Romans 1, everyone's heard the gospel, only few will find it, right? Um, but we should ha have this attitude in, in Luke, sorry, I didn't spell Luke properly, Luke 15. Uh, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. You know, this is the ratio of nine to one. And um, I didn't include the previous uh, parable of the lost sheep, which is a ratio of 99 to one. But I like what it says there in, in Luke, 10, uh, Luke 15 verse 10, uh, that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. You know, that should be the mindset we have. You know, we want to share the gospel and win some, just one person. One person this year. If you've never, if you've never won per, a, a person to the Lord, make 2024 the year that you share the gospel to that one person. Or get that person saved. Or find someone to share the gospel and get someone saved. You know, there's nothing... You know, if you've ever felt that experience, especially the first time, man, that is, that is something that is like... It, it, it sort of shapes your whole week. Like, wow, that, I got that person saved. For a whole week and a half or two weeks or even a month that you just you're like wow you're so excited that you got to share the gospel and see someone get saved and then it shakes you but here we see there is joy in the presence of of the angels of god over one sinner that repenteth don't tell me that the that the, the blood has lost its power don't tell me that soul winning doesn't work then that just shows me you're lazy that you're not willing to go out and spend time preaching the gospel it says this in psalm 126 6 he that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, are you going forth? Are you, are you, are you sowing the seed? The Bible says, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, th throughout the whole year, if you think about what farmers do, you know, they, they have crops that they uh, only harvest in a certain time. And that should be like us. Like, you know, some, there's sometimes when we go out soul winning for a week or two weeks, or one month even, where it feels like, you know, maybe we haven't seen someone saved yet. But honestly, if you stick at it, you'll, you will meet someone saved. You will be able to share the gospel and win someone to the Lord. Um, and it's interesting how, you know, since we started that, that outreach ministry in Liverpool, you know, I think in August we started, we, we've been going to the Liverpool streets and sharing the people that people just walk by like, hey, you know, can I share the gospel? And I think ever since August, you know, August, uh, September, October, November, even December, we went twice, one to Macquarie. We've seen someone get saved at least once. At least one person we've seen get someone saved. You know, that, that should, that, that enough is to, to tell me, you know, it still works. It's just people that are lazy. They don't want to share the gospel. They don't want to be part of the ministry of reconciliation. They don't think that hell is real. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, that I'm not ashamed of the, the gospel of Christ, but it's the power of God into salvation. You know, you should come out with us should go out and preach the gospel. And he shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. John 4 says this, um, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together, and hearing, and here is, is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. So my friend, this year, may you be the year that you sow the seed, you share the gospel, and hopefully you also see that, uh, you see the reaping of it, right? you see someone get saved. All right, so the last point I really want to close off with is uh, that what hinders the ministry of reconciliation, as we saw, was it the fear? Was it shame or not knowing? Uh, or is it the attitude of it doesn't work? The last one is, uh, what hinders it is the lack of love. You know, the God, uh, Jesus commands us, you know, to share the gospel. And what we know in John 14, 15, as we've been there from the beginning, 
If you love me, keep my commandments. And it is a commandment to preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, it's, it's not just to the apostles. It's to every believer. If we were all, like, you know, if, if no one's, if not ever, if, if so many stopped after the apostles, you know, Christianity wouldn't be where it is today. Obviously, we see where it is today is because people went out and preached the gospel and shared the message. Not only to friends, but open evangelism. So have this mind. Do you believe? Do you love God? Do you love God in 2024? Keep His commandments. Preach the gospel, being one of them. Read His Bible, pray. But if you've been lacking on preaching the gospel, can you really say you love God, but you're not sharing the gospel? I can't say you are. I can't say you are loving God. Uh, I want to close off with this passage, 2 Corinthians 5. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So, you think of what God, the punishment of God has for the sinner. You know, that alone should already stir you. Like, you know, these guys are going to hell. You know, there's probably a time in your life that you didn't know what salvation is. That maybe you're afraid of what, uh, what death would bring to you. And with that terror, knowing the terror of the Lord, why don't you persuade men? We persuade men. Preach the gospel. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, or it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Verse 14, I sort of want to draw here. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Does the work of God constrain you? Does the work, sorry, does the love of Christ constrain you this morning? Does it, will it constrain you for 2024? You know, are you going to go out knowing that the terror of the Lord, you want to persuade men? May 2024 be the year where you take the work of God and do greater works. And so think about it this year. If you've really not shared the gospel, do you really love God? Does really, the love of God dwell in you? You see the need of the world? And it's very simple. Sharing the gospel and doing the greater work. Doing the work of God. So hopefully you learned something this morning. Hopefully it stirred you for 24, 2024 to share the gospel. Uh, door knocking is a good example. And even in, as we go to street evangelism. Come. Come, to, come, come with. And, uh, or if, if, if those times don't see you, I'm happy myself. You tell me. Like, hey, let's meet here. Um, I'll come with you. I'll be willing to do that. I'll put my name right here right now and standing before you um, to share and say, hey, you know, if you're willing to go out, tell me, let's meet. I'm willing to go uh, on a good suitable time and I will try not, I wouldn't make excuses of any, any time as uh, another brother went to Macquarie shopping center, I was willing to go with him, you know. So if you want to go out, if you want to know how to share the gospel and if that's lacking in your life, I'm willing to go with you and in a time that's more convenient for you just to help you uh, to grow in that area. But greater works. Greater works. All right, so let's close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, I just thank you for your word that we can open it. And uh, I thank you, God, that you died on the cross for us. And you buried and rose again. You saved us from all of our sins. Cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And I pray, God, as we have eternal life, we have everlasting life. Um, I pray that we won't hold that peace to ourselves but we will be able to share the gospel. So equip us, stir us, um, help us to know your word, to grow in it, that we can uh, share the gospel to our friends and loved ones, uh, and that we, have, we probably have in our own heart and our own mind that people, we want to get saved, and, and uh, we're praying for other people to preach the gospel to them too. But for us, that we fulfilled the Great Commission and uh, the Macedonian call, or even the prayer from hell, where the the rich man woke up and was telling him that he'd, he wants his uh, family to hear the gospel and to be saved. You know, I pray that we have that passion for souls, that hell is real, and uh, that we can share the gospel. So thanks be to you, God, and thank you for your people here. May we have good fellowship and blessing this, this afternoon. I ask all these things in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen.